you know, one way to build uh, an assessment would be in the form of a game. Because, you know, I I had played these online role-playing games where, you know, you essentially immerse in an environment, right? You go meet characters, you have decisions to make. Um, and those decisions would uh, kind of influence your path in the game. But then, I mean, uh, one could also infer a lot about you, right? So, uh, for example, in a very crazy, let's say, a game where you have to go around uh, finding resources, meeting people, maybe shooting monsters. There are some people who you know like to uh, play. They like to you know make sure that they've explored every single uh, part of the storyline. They've talked to different people. You know that really want like they they're really excited about that. There's some. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to PM Schools MEB podcast. Uh, in today's episode eight, we have Sakti Arora. Who is the founder of Talent Litmus? Uh, he's also my ex boss from Purple School uh, back in 2015. Hey, hey, Sateep, welcome to the podcast. How are you, man? Hi, Nikon. I'm great. Uh, nice, to, nice to be here with you guys. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a fun chat. For sure, for sure. Sateep, before we dive into obviously a, a lot of themes that we have figured for the podcast, Ekbar, can you just give, give us an like, introduction of what you've been up to in the last couple of years? The last couple of years? <laughs> last. <laughs> Actually, I mean, I think my introduction for the last two, three, four, five, six, seven years would be broadly the same. I mean, yeah. so I mean, I've I've been uh, working on talent litmus. It's been uh, quite a journey. Uh, we started off in 2016. The last, well, the last couple of years specifically have been to uh, have essentially been aimed at. I mean, COVID was really tough for us. So you know, just coming out of that. Um, we, you know, had to make up for lost time, had to scale fast. So it's been, uh, it's been a, it's been, a, so uh, it's been a, very, it's been very difficult two years. I had to work really hard, uh, hustle a lot, uh, and the focus has been to basically scale up revenue, find uh, additional revenue sources, uh, find ways in which we can, you know, uh, so you know find ways in which we can build additional products, additional features to generate additional revenue streams from our existing customers who we already serve. So, so that's been the focus for the last couple of years specifically. Awesome. So, Sapreet, uh, you talked about the last two years. I want to go back to the starting, right? So I was reading an article from 2019 that, uh, you know, you built games slash gamified experiences to shortlist candidates, right? And you mentioned how people lose their guard while playing games. And that is absolutely true because both Nikunj and I come from a gaming experience and we have seen uh, we've seen how uh, when people play, you know, real money gaming or other uh, hyper casual games as well. And that, you know, gives more insight to the behavior of the user, right? So talk to us how you stumbled upon this solution slash idea and the larger problem space your company is trying to solve. Right. So, so actually I'll start off from where we are today. Uh, broadly, what we do is uh, we are a platform for game-based assessments and learning, which means that in very simple terms, we have like, uh, we essentially build games and we have two verticals. One is uh, assessments and the second is learning. Uh, I mean, uh, games are, you know, uh, games are uh, common, basically games are the common denominator in everything that we do. That's, that's sort of our USP, that's, that's how we operate. And uh, we, you know, ask, Co-founders, as you know, as even as a company, as an organization, really believe in the power of games, and uh, you know, we could talk about how games help uh, in both of these use cases. Uh, but uh, you know, coming to your question, we started off uh, from the assessments uh, side. Uh, so back in twenty sixteen. Uh, so back in twenty sixteen, uh, Nikunj, you know, just mentioned we were working at Purple Squirrel. You know, that story kind of ended. Uh, uh, one of my colleagues, our colleagues rather, uh, was Kiran Vadva. Uh, and, you know, after Purple Squirrel, we were looking at various problem statements that, you know, we could uh, solve, uh, you know, some something that really appealed to us, something that, you know, really excited us. And uh, I think, uh, for, uh, I mean, uh, not really putting anybody down or you know, not me meaning to be crit critical, but at Purple Squirrel, we had this com constant circus of, you know, people moving across departments, the organization trying to figure out who can do sales, you know, who can do product, who can do operations, you know, and yeah, it, it was kind of a circus. And uh, I mean, if you actually look at it, right, uh, 
people, uh, especially in startups, right? Uh, you look at people who are expected to hire. They've never been trained to hire. Like, I mean, they've. So the organizations are basically telling people, you know, go with your gut feel, hire who you think you are, and uh, that is uh, that is not very optimal, and it leads to problems, uh, which is you know you have high attrition, bad hires, and so on. So it was a problem statement that we really uh, that we you know thought was interesting and uh, to be honest the world was trying to solve it uh, in various ways one of the ways was through psychometric assessments right uh, not sure if you know you know what exactly psychometric assessments are or maybe audience but you know just to sort of put it very simply these are behavioral assessments like your MB MBTI is an example you have various personality assessments they essentially tell you about an individual you know what could be their strengths weaknesses uh, how could they be as managers? What are their motivations? And so on. So uh, these are simple assessments now. Uh, the, so when we were looking at this problem statement, there were so many different psychometric assessments around, you know, and established psychometric assessments been there for 50 years, actually started off during the Second World War where the US government wanted to figure out the right people who should be put in various different roles, who should be in combat roles, who should be, you know, so that is where the story started. Now, we were in 2016 and uh, essentially what was once a pencil paper questionnaire had just come online, there was no real evolution. Uh, very boring question. So one of, for example, right, a uh, question that you could see on one of these assessments is on a Sunday, are you more likely to read a book or go out, go out and meet friends, right? Uh, now, if I was applying for a sales role in a company, I would say you know, I would want on a Sunday I would go and meet out, go and meet friends. I'm not a introvert who likes to sit at home and read books, right? So people tended to fake it, extremely boring, uh, no real evolution, uh, and they honestly they weren't quite working for a lot of different organizations. So we said, you know, maybe uh, uh, you know th this is some place that we can work, and we it's almost uh, you know the idea actually came through during a brainstorming session, which is just, I mean, one of those things that happen where, you know, during a conversation where, uh, you know, I actually told my co-founder, you know, if, you know, one way to build uh, an assessment would be in the form of a game, because, you know, I'd, I had played these online role-playing games where, you know, you essentially immerse in an environment, right? You go meet characters, you have decisions to make, um, and those decisions would uh, kind of influence your path in the game, but then it, I mean, uh, one could also infer a lot about you, right? So, uh, for example, in a very crazy, let's say, a game where you have to go around uh, finding resources, meeting people, maybe shooting monsters, there are some people who, you know, like to uh, play, they like to, you know, make sure that they've explored every single uh, path of the storyline, they've talked to different people, you know, that really, want, like, they, they're really excited about that. There's some people who really like the shooting aspect, you know, just bam, bam, just the, actually the violence aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, so, so it can tell you a lot of, a lot about people. And uh, honestly, I just, you know, just, you know, the idea just came out saying that, you know, probably we can't do it because maybe, you know, too expensive to start off with, but, you know, we, if we could build a game, that would be really interesting. And then, you know, we said, why not, you know, just maybe explore, even if it doesn't work out. And then, you know, that's how our journey started. So it's, the idea came because, you know, I guess the two of us, I mean, more me, less of Kiran, but, uh, you know, we were basically interested in games. We had experienced something, you know, in something in a very entirely different space. And we were looking at a problem statement, which, you know, had to be solved. And then it's just... That happened during brainstorming sessions, you know, somebody says something and somebody else builds on it. So that's where the idea originated. Obviously, there was a whole uh, fairly, la fairly lengthy process of validating it and things like that. Um, but yeah, it was, I think it was a bit of a, I guess, uh, happy stance, chance. Yeah. Coffee, coffee, interesting. Yeah, happy. But we, uh, just like going like deeper into now we have figured ki, achha, this is a space problem that you want to work on right uh, uh how do you sort of like uh, how did you hit product market fit like obviously for you to reach a stage where you know ha, achha, ye problem hai, and now you could sort of transition those set of questions in a psychometric test into a game uh 
uh, in your context, how did you define product market fit? For you, there must have been that we will reach X number of users. It could be a monetization play. Was feasibility check at the stage that you were in back then, right? How did you figure that this happened, so this will be product market fit for us? And obviously, you can talk to us from maybe a B two B perspective. How many milestones you had? That we will uh, need to reach like three clients or maybe like X dollars of revenue. What were those targets and like what definition of product market fit for you? Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, back in 2016, I uh, when I actually looked at this, uh, we did not really look at it from the perspective of any standard framework. I don't even know if there were uh, there were a lot of frameworks back then. Uh, I remember back in 2015, I was googling what does a product manager do. So, <laughs> so 2016 wasn't very. I mean, I knew what a product manager does, but it's not as if you had a very um, evolved thinking of a complex framework of a product manager fit, product product market fit. Uh, but uh, the idea was always to stick to uh, the stick to first principles. Look everything from first principles. Uh, do not make a lot of assumptions. Validate uh, everything. Uh, so so that was the idea. Now, to me, I mean, if I had to sort of, I mean, sort of thinking back, how I looked at product market fit was. I think the first thing that's necessary that I thought was, look, there should be a real need, right? Uh, there should be a real need. And uh, I think in most cases, it should be a need that's either underserved or not served at all. Um, in our case, what we realized was, hey, you know, people are making bad hires all the time. Uh, and uh, the sort of uh, existing psychometric assessments weren't, you know, exciting a lot of organizations weren't exciting a lot of people, uh, weren't very effective. And uh, I mean, just look at it, right? I mean, if uh, if you actually sit and calculate the cost of a bad hire, uh, you just sort of understand the uh, gravity of the need, right? I mean, say you hire somebody, doesn't work out probably six months of salary, uh, six months of output, and then when somebody leaves, all the chaos that it creates around you, right? So it's uh, plus what do you invest in training, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I mean, we actually sort of quantified and, uh, you know, it was a significant number of, number that we saw. Uh, so that sort of told us that it was, it was, and it was, it was definitely a need that companies have to solve uh, if we could create something that works much better than, you know, what's already up there. Uh, it, it certainly will save companies a lot of money and then, uh, you know, it's some, um, and we could sort of, uh, as somebody who is delivering that value could, uh, build a financially viable business. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, one, there has to be a real need, I guess, from a product market fit perspective, then there should be enough people with that need, I guess, uh, you know, the market should be large. Uh, very intuitively, right? Uh, everybody does a job. All companies hire. So seems like uh, seems like a very broad base uh, kind. Seem to us like a very broad base uh, need. And you know, honestly, it's a need that is not very focused on. Uh, it's not very India focused, right? It's it's something that could. I mean, if we build something, then if we we could actually potentially sell it everywhere. Uh, to organizations across the world. So it did seem very broad based. Uh, having said that, it's it's a folly to, you know, just obviously go on intuition on these things. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's funny that, I mean, uh, it's w one of the things that I realized that, I, I mean, it's, it's something that I realized a few months into my journey that, you know, I should not have thought that I should not have gone with this basic assumption that this is broad based because once you actually start running the numbers, it can actually be very interesting. So, um, you know, uh, so after we had actually started building the product, uh, we, uh, I'd, uh, you know, actually, you know, it's one of the things that I just did, right? I said, you know, let me calculate the dollar value of the India market. You know, let's just do the India right. market. Seems huge, but, you know, let's just go there, right? Oh, uh, uh, I, so I, so I thought, okay, you know, uh, so basically what I need is I need to find the number of people who are working for organizations in white collar jobs. I mean, I guess construction workers don't count. Uh, most blue collar jobs wouldn't sort of uh, need uh, something like this. So white collar jobs and 
I was a little shocked when I realized that you know we have like a population of about I mean I don't know what's the number right now, uh, but definitely uh, you know in excess of one thirty. So I what's one point four one point four billion. Yeah, one point four crores. Well, sorry, one one forty crores, right? Now out of those, right, they just maybe one and a half to two crore blue collar white collar workers in India. Like that's it, right? And then and then you start count uh, maybe uh, okay actually maybe more maybe three and a half crores if you count government jobs, but maybe you know selling to government wouldn't be our sweet spot. So you know taking that out just two crore one and a half two crore people. Then you have teachers, doctors, where you know something like this is not. I mean, we didn't foresee that this product would be used in cases like that, and you cut down, cut down, cut down, cut down. It's probably a sub one CR user market, and then you multiply it by what you can earn per assessment, and uh, you realize it's not. It's a big market, but it's not a huge market. Like it's not you know one of those fintech markets, right? Uh, you know, uh, so it's not like a hundred billion dollar market or a five hundred billion dollar. It's it, it's it's uh, a maybe a uh, 1000 crore market right and then um, and then so i mean all of this is very consequential you know later in the journey you realize you know all of these things are very consequential so uh, i mean it did not i mean it did not completely break down the entire thing for us we still thought it was a big enough market and then you have a you also have a global market so i mean it was fairly big enough but uh, i mean it would have been i think it's one of those things that you should know before you you know uh, right. start building stuff so underserved i so i was talking about uh, a need that is underserved a need that is widespread enough uh, i think enough people should have that need uh, and then hey they should also be willing to pay for it uh, absolutely right sometimes uh, people have a need because you think they have a need and probably they do but you know they not they might not want to pay for it uh, right. might not be a priority for them in their lives or whatever so, um, so yeah, I mean, we uh, and I'll sort of this is this is very interesting, and I'll you know maybe come to it uh, a couple of minutes later. But the, like, it's super important, um, and I'll come to it from a B two B perspective. But yeah, I mean, you people should be willing to pay for the need, and then uh, you know you should be able. I mean, something a solution should be, let's say, technologically possible, right, uh, to fulfill that need. And then once you start building it, I guess. Product market fit would me would be you should have really happy customers who do not who you can retain over long periods of time without a lot of effort. Right, that's that's right. Uh, that sort of product market fit for me. Uh, now, I in a very B two B perspective, right? I I I I mean it's it's something that I mean I believe uh, from my own personal experience of talent it means that it's it's a bit of a mistake to look at B two B and B two C differently. Just, differently. I mean, it's something that one should not do at all, and I'll explain why. Right now, even when so when I was talking about everything that I've talked about until now, right, in terms of need, uh, you know, how much benefit can a solution like this uh, derive uh, for our customers? We I've talked about it in terms of the organization, right? But essentially. There is no organization, as in you're not, you cannot go and talk to an organization, right? You can't talk, start, stand in front of an office and talk to a building, right? You cannot do that. So uh, it's important to uh, really understand that uh, it's really understand who's really going to pay you. Uh, so I mean, who's going to use your product? So buyer, user, you could also maybe bring in gatekeepers, people who will, you know, give approvals. So I, it really is important to look at it from this perspective. Um, so, so I will actually explain one of the things that actually didn't go right for us. We thought we thought we we had actually built a great product, which we I mean, <laughs> which I still do, uh, and uh, and and so do our customers. Uh, uh, my sense was that people are going to, you know, I mean, the adoption is going to be really quick on this because, you know, we had built something that is very differentiated and, uh, hey, it solves a big problem. It's a fairly relevant problem at least, right? Uh, now, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, the buyers, gatekeepers, whoever, in, you know, uh, in, this, in this particular context, the HRs in an organization, the human resources department is essentially, uh, you know, the person who will uh, decide 
you know what they want to use for uh, for something like this they will also decide uh, if they want to i mean a lot of times it goes from their budgets mostly it does uh, sometimes it doesn't and uh, yeah i mean if uh, so so it's they 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 they're, so they're going to pay for it they're even going to decide on it now the now uh, the organization would definitely benefit from what we are sort of trying to sell them correct but the question is are they benefiting from what they what we are trying to sell them right i yeah. think it's a very fundamental important question that has to be asked and uh, it cannot and something like this cannot be answered subjectively so uh, say in a use case like this what you should ask is that this person why is this person working right this person is work what this, does this person want this person i mean yeah happiness but not maybe at that level but from a purely if, when this person is at his or her job uh, they want uh, they want to be promoted they want they have goals they have kras that they have to hit at least today right i mean not 20 years ago but today everybody has especially in large organizations have kras right i have to hit this 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 is this Yeah. and they and they wouldn't give a damn about anything that is not related to the care you know they are not thinking my company will benefit no they know that how am i supposed to sort of work right and it works for organizations so in our context uh, you know the question to ask is whose care is it to reduce bad hires as in who gets fired if there are a lot of bad hires turns out the hr the hr most hr have do not have these care correct like Absolutely. their job is to bring in candidates the interviewer hires them and if it i mean the i mean the candidate doesn't work out then it's the inter, i mean the manager's problem right they didn't they weren't able to train them they didn't they didn't hire right they didn't conduct the right interview or whatever so so the hr has no kra that says that go improve hires correct Now, Now, what that meant was when we were meeting these HRs, they said, "Excellent product, and you know, it, we think it it can be really effective." But they didn't prioritize it, right? They didn't. I mean, it's good to have whatever, right? So they didn't prioritize it, and which made it really difficult to sell it, uh, right? Um, on the other hand, you know, when we had customers, they started using our products. The reviews were great, and you know, they never sort of, you know, very low churn rates through you know through our sort of life of talent litmus so so it's interesting to uh, you know i think it's important to not look at b2b and b2c differently at all correct uh, you should basically look at who am i selling to and am i fulfilling his or her personal motivations and needs my job essentially as a b2b person is to get somebody a promotion uh, that's that's honestly how you know people should be looking at these things um so uh, i guess uh, you know i was talking about this in context of needs and you know whether you know uh, people are willing to pay for the needs right uh, so yeah i mean uh, i think it's super important to uh, understand this particular aspect about your product or business when you're figuring out product market fit and uh, it's something that honestly you know when we started selling it took us about took us I mean, I took us, I think, about eight to ten months, maybe a year, to figure this out. Uh, and I mean, I honestly, you know, with all my MBA <laughs> knowledge and all of that, I could, you know, build theoretical uh, stuff on paper and even talk to people. But you know, uh, we actually had actually gone and met an HR consultant. We were just sort of chatting, and they were like, and you know, he said, "Okay, what are you doing?" And you know, we explained the idea five minutes, and he said, "Ye koi nahi karidne wala." So <laughs> and I was like, oh wow! I mean, why? I mean, I've never like I I was actually happy because I'd met somebody who would tell me, you know, why is in this selling, and then you know he was like, they, they don't care, they don't have a care. So I said that is when we realized, and you know, uh, what that meant was we tried actually went and tried to sell, you know, not the HR but sell to other people in organization. Unfortunately, every time we did that, they said, you know, we don't understand these things. Go to the HR. so uh, it's a problem that we ran into and uh, it's a very peculiar problem it's sort of a corner case actually uh, in terms of product market fit but it's something that i think people should people wouldn't uh, overlook if they you know saw a b2b business as more or less like a b2c company b2c business 
Awesome. So I think the key takeaway is here is uh, don't, you know, consider B2B and B2C separately yeah. and figure out uh, the ideal customer profile. Right? Yes. And that yeah, is- and whether you're truly, truly satisfying what they really want, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe in a B, maybe, you know what, I think maybe B2C can be a little bit more about impulsive needs and things like that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in B2B, you have uh, KRA needs of your stakeholders. I think that's and I think the true metric of uh, people really needing it is when they start paying for it. Right? They start paying for it. They keep using it. I think that's keep important. using retention essentially. Yeah. Uh, interesting. I move on to you know a similar sort of a question, right? We were reading Lenny Rachitsky's blog and found that for B two B, the first few clients is you don't need to read a blog for that. It's pretty obvious. But the first few clients from uh, first few clients come from your network, right? Essentially, colleagues and friends, etc. So how did you go about, you know, uh, closing your first few clients? And by client, we mean people who, you know, eventually started paying, right? Yeah, so so we did find the first few clients in our network. And uh, I think what really helped was that, you know, once we had this basic idea, I think we spent a lot of time validating. I mean, I don't think it was perfect validation. Correct. But we tried to be as thorough as possible in our validation, which meant that, we had questionnaires, we had interviews with, you know, HRs, trying to figure out price points, needs, you know, things that they would want, not want, and so on. So, it was fairly extensive. Uh, and, uh, you know, that process involved us reaching out within our network, finding HRs, trying to find HRs within, our, within the extended network, and, you know, trying to talk to them, figuring things out. And, uh, you know, uh, the... It's just, you know, just psychometrics, the, just the nature of the whole thing. It took us a very long time to, you know, build it. Uh, something like this does take a lot of time. So we took about an, about a year to actually nine, nine to 10 months to build out the whole thing. So through the process, we were constantly taking feedback, uh, constantly, you know, interviewing people, uh, talking to, uh, you know, folks in the HR fraternity. And uh, we found our first customers within those people, right? Because, uh, you know, uh, I think it was, some of them had already bought into the idea because they were a part of the process. And um, uh, I think there was, I think a big factor is also trust uh, when you're a very small company in the B2B space. So, um, you know, you might be here, might not be here six months later, right? So what am I going to do then? So I think uh, that the entire thing that involving actual stakeholders in the building process really helps uh, get you those first uh, customers because it helps build trust. And also the entire process is, I mean, the selling process, the entire thing is actually just a mini selling process. And then yeah. not a mini selling process, an uh, elongated selling process. Got it. Very interesting. I think the key takeaway here for me would be reach out to your network uh, and then, you know, maybe figure out two or three people, essentially two or three clients with whom you can sort of co-build your product. Right? Yes, yes, yes. And not everybody will be interested eventually. Not everybody will be interested. 10, 15 people, you know, you might find two or three people who would be, you know, exactly. give, you, give you a lot of, a lot of people will just give you feedback for the sake of it. There'll be some people who would, you know, really give you feedback like they really mean it and like they really Correct. Mean it. Yeah. Correct. And those should, those are the people you should really hang on to. Yeah. Good. Uh, moving on, so you have cracked, like, say, a first set of clients, right? And who are using your product, uh, you have hit, let's say, the first base. Now, initial revenue uh, starts coming in. Now you have to plan the next stage of growth, right? You have to figure what to build on the product. Uh, do you sort of now keep solving an adjacent problem? Okay, I've built this set of assessments. Now, do I build, like, a newer set of assessments for a different profile, like, using the same set of games? Or do you like build, uh, uh, maybe solve for a different problem for the HR, right? Because now you're working very closely with that customer profile. How do you sort of think of those considerations once you have sort of like after the first, it's been seven years, right? I'm just trying to understand uh, how do you evolve the product? Uh, how do you change your hiring also? Because you everything sort of follows downstream. Ki haan, now you, you have solved A, either you now crack like N more units of like companies and you are focusing on sales. Now, what happens to product in the meanwhile? Right? You're essentially transitioning into the next stage of your company, right? So how does that shift happen? Like, and uh, since it's been seven years, I'm pretty sure you've two times seen it. You've seen it first, you've seen base product. Bana hai. Now moving on to itne clients. And now for you to retain them, what is the next stage? How do you sort of keep evolving? Right, right. So, so I think it's... Uh, uh, 
uh, it's important to so when i i think the evolution in the evolution of a product i think to a large extent depends on uh, what a customer really wants uh, and it should really evolve in that direction uh, for us uh, specifically when we start we started off building this behavioral assessment uh, there are various sort of ways that we took uh, for different reasons so uh, i'll give you i can actually give you some examples so so when we built this out i think the uh, one of the first things that we realized was that uh, people want uh, you know in india especially uh, when people are hiring for entry level roles uh, and entry level roles is important uh, i'll i'll also explain why because for for us specifically because you know uh, in india when you have a job pool when you put out a job then there are some thousand applications right uh, you uh, an hr might not care so much about the kras might not be so aligned to finding the best sort of shortlist but they definitely need a shortlist right they definitely need a shortlist because otherwise just not they wouldn't be able to they can't send thousand people for interviews right uh so th- so so then they definitely need filters which could be you know our assessment we uh, we realized that if we want to uh, fulfill this entry level market uh, it's important to have for example multiple languages right we started off in english uh, we didn't anticipate this early on but we realized very soon that you know we need multiple languages so uh, so then we had the tool translated into multiple languages uh, made that available um so so that was you know an example of something that we realized while you know so we started off targeting a fairly broad uh, market and then we figured out that you know we have to target niches and then we realized that the entry level niche which is also fell i mean it's, it's actually quite big is uh, would would need uh, you know us translating the tool to multiple languages another example i could give was you know uh, we realized that you know we we had a very unique assessment but eventually we were competing with other assessment platforms now we had as now when there are other assessment platforms uh, i think the we realized that uh, we had a disadvantage where we were a behavioral assessment and then other other sort of uh, assessment platforms were more broad based they would have an aptitude assessment a behavioral assessment some technical assessment so they had, they basically had a suit and now when an hr wants to they don't ideally want to use two or three platforms right so which meant that uh, you know we were at a uh, disadvantage we realized that and then we started out then we started building you know uh, so the next step what for us was build a game based aptitude assessment right uh, you do not want to figure out a lot about the personality about an often individual just want to see if they can their basic intelligence can they you know figure out figure out numbers and you know have basic conversation skills language skills so then we build that so it, so we realized that uh, yeah so i think the idea was to overcome a disadvantage but also to fulfill all the need an immediate need that you know my my customer already has so uh, so that is where uh, we uh, realized that uh, i think uh, i think uh, a slightly different example of picking up an adjacent space would be us moving on to learning uh, it again came from you know talking to our customers uh, you know one of our one of our customers who, who was you know had been a part of our journey right from the front, up, right from the start uh, it said that you know uh, what you're doing in assessments is really interesting uh, uh, now uh, the game based assessment that you have you know people find it really engaging the person the person who's being who has to be hired right so i think uh, during our conversation we realized that the basic one of the basic value proposition is that we provide a very interesting experience where people do not feel uh, that it is a very something is a very tedious experience they are having fun i think it has an immediate implication to the learning the learning domain as well where the basic essential problem is just people not uh, you know liking the whole experience not being able to capture people's attentions for long enough so that is why it started and you know we started exploring it but i think the real switch really happened during covid uh, where you know 2020 uh, just after our uh, seed, uh, just our, just after we were seed funded uh, covid hit and basically nobody was hiring right and uh, which meant that our our assessment revenue like 95% of it died up and it was almost like uh, 
a survival uh, i mean we were really in survival mode and uh, we really accelerated the whole move to learning because uh, we realized that pe- companies still need to function people still need to learn there is no more there's no more face to face training right i mean there are no classrooms anymore there are no training rooms anymore now, everything is going to be online uh, for you know a fair amount of time and online learning then becomes very important for organizations suddenly uh, so it was also you know uh, an event an external event that sort of triggered and uh, you see a lot of companies uh, during that time started investing a lot in uh, their learning platforms and so on and uh that that is where we also sort of you know set up this vertical started generating revenue from that and uh, eventually realized that this, this could the second vertical the learning vertical is a far bigger market is actually like a thousand times bigger than the assessments market and uh could be far more lucrative as well so so yeah so it's uh, uh, that is where we found the adjacent space fundamentally i think it's important to keep in touch with your customers and then look for needs that you can fulfill for them uh i but i think it's also important to add that it's not always necessary to sort of go so broad based if you can fulfill a need that uh, if it's financially lucrative to stick to just one need uh, if you can say build a billion dollar company just sticking to one narrow need i think that's perfect i think you shouldn't be looking for anything else uh, but yes i mean you you can build features and so on to counter competition etc but in a lot of spaces especially b2b you know uh, a single product often often doesn't do it um, and because of market size and so on and then you have to build a suite of products so that is, that's been our journey got it so uh, so please one last question right uh, what is uh, you know one question which you always ask if you're hiring for a product manager let's say an associate product manager or a product manager right yeah so i mean honestly i've never really conducted uh, um structured interviews uh, mm-hmm. i think uh, i think my general philosophy uh, so one of the things that we obviously do is uh, we get people to take our assessment because uh, correct because we really seen how effective it is and i mean yeah. uh, it would be stupid not to use it but uh, when when it comes to an interview right uh, fundamentally i think it's important uh, for me to understand if i can work with somebody you know i think that's i think i think sometimes there can be people who are great in their own right but they do not make a great team um so uh, so yeah i think it's important to understand various you know general aptitude about uh, a product man- about somebody being able to be a product good product manager but it's also important to see if i can work with that person and how i do it is that i i mean typically have very unstructured interviews and um it generally i i mean i start off talking about people's interests you know where do, where do they spend time online for example right if i'm interviewing somebody who does not really uh, for example uh, let's say um let's okay what could be an app uh, let's say uh, some somebody i so for example right uh, if i i i use credit but maybe a fresher today might not have a credit card right they might they have no use for that app they might not have seen it so there's no point me you know even wanting to discuss it so i typically look for people's interest and then try to uh, have a very informal interview where we talk about where i'm able to where i want to see if people can really think from first principles and look at all possible implications of a product decision so uh, for for example i think the last interview that i was conducting was during the whole uh, twitter saga when uh, uh, elon musk took over and he introduced those you know paid blue tick some 10 dollars 11 dollars whatever right so uh, so you know i think it was a great example i think it was a great side of for an interview and i think the, during the interview that person used twitter and i was like uh, okay so you know what is the problem that this pro- person is elon musk is trying to solve using these blue ticks does it really solve the problem where can it go wrong what are the financial implications of something like this uh, how can you know how what could he have possibly done better you know if he wanted to make more money let's say twitter is it doing so well financially how do you generate revenue out of that um, what can be variations of blue ticks if trust is an issue right i think the conversation was that i think it's if you start selling blue ticks then where is the trust right i mean that can just anybody with a credit card can just then be certified so then how what are alternative ways uh, how would you uh, 
So for example, you could have some kind of a community voting system, then how would you go and build such a system? What would be different steps? So it's, it, it's, 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 it's a little informal, but it's basically looking at every possible direction a product manager has to think in, a product manager has to make sure that what uh, they're building makes financial sense, uh, right up front. Uh, Solve again solves a real need. Doesn't just pretend. I mean, I mean you can just say that you know the blue tick thing will solve this problem, but does it really, right? I mean, can they really look at it holistically? Can they look at possible you know drawbacks? Okay, maybe something works ninety percent, but you know ten percent it can lead to some problems. How do you sort of counter them? Uh, how do you go out and go about building such a thing? You know, do you build it in parts? Do you, how do you uh, test out your hypothesis in something like this? Or you, do you just go Elon Musk and launch, right? <laughs> or do you actually test out things? Uh, is there a way to validate? I mean, it's best if you do not build something out and then test it rolling out in the market. That's the most expensive way to, you know, validate a hypothesis. Can, and it can really cost you in, in, in a lot of ways. I mean, honestly, I think the most heartbreaking thing for a product manager would be to have a feature that nobody uses or a product that nobody uses. Um, and you don't want to go there. So I think uh, it's important to how, go about how do you build it. And also, I think uh, it's important to understand the technical side of things. So if you want to build something that, for example, uses generative AI, right? Do you understand that stuff? You know, do you understand broadly uh, what is possible, what is not possible, things like that? So, so yeah, I think it's it's a very typically it's I have a different sort of discussion every interview or at least I mean I mean if there are two or three interviews on the same then probably the same discussion but I think if they are a few months apart then it's something new all the time it's also interviews can also get a little boring uh, for the interviewer so I think it's a, I I generally feel it's also important for me to have a have a have a fun time and then uh, during that process I get to know right can we can we work together do I learn something from you. Can you, you know, can I get some insights from you? And um, can you be very first principle basis? You really don't need to come in knowing any framework, honestly. So I think I think that that's that's how I go about it. Super interesting, Sabir. Because in a way, structured interviews also are that only. It's just I, that you are talking about a product. Uh, instead of you asking a pointed question, you are just like opening it up. Achha, why do you, why did the decision take place? Or why is this trend happening? Yeah. So, Sure, and, think, and it's important for me to see if they can think in that moment, right? I mean, if they do not have that some information, I'll, okay, you know, I'll tell them, okay, you know, I read this news article and what they said was this was the reason and whatever. What do you think? So, yeah, I think it's, so it's informal that way. But yeah, I think, yeah, I get what you're saying. I think it's, it's okay. also, uh, I mean, yeah, there is sort of a fixed agenda. There's a problem statement. We'll go in four directions. So it's also a little structured that way, yeah. I think obviously Ankit will uh, uh, resonate with this. I think most of the good product thinkers generally spend a lot of time on the why. He mm -hmm. Q, Q, and won't jump to. Generally, people who can elaborate the psyche around ki maybe the person must have thought of this. Maybe and thinking of all the positive and negative scenarios. If you can double down on that, then that's where I think the game is for more. Yeah. Yes, I, and I think it, it brings helps bring out an, a very important aspect, which is basic empathy. And not just for your user, every stakeholder that you like, if you are right. a product manager, you need to understand, you know, what's the marketing team ka motivation, what's your, you know, how do your devs look at it? Uh, how do your customers look at it? Obviously, how does it solve various problems? Do you, can you actually say, put yourself in those, their customer's shoes, in that customer's shoes? You know, if you are, talk to a dev, they'll build things that are interesting and probably are easy to, maybe quick to build. Uh, if you look, if you, every person can give you a different perspective, but a product manager is really supposed to understand all different perspectives. He's supposed to understand basic design principles, uh, you know, consumer psyche and so on. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a really interesting role, I think, uh, in most cases. And yeah, I think interviews should be able to bring that out, right? Can they have empathy for almost every person that they interact with? Totally, totally, totally. Th thank you for such an insightful conversation. I had a fun time uh, engaging with you after Gunter Saman's time and would love to like chat up more on uh, the start of your working on. All the best, Satpeet, and thank you for being uh, like, yeah. Th thanks for having Good me. Yeah. Thank you so much. Th thanks for having me. And yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I think it, it was a nice conversation. And uh, for sure, we'll catch up, I think, I guess, offline. Yeah.